Hey, everybody, welcome. Uh, really good to have you. Great to be with you. Welcome all campuses and venues, those of you worshiping at Stowe or Aurora Highland Square Restoration over in East Hall. Everywhere, welcome. To the first weekend of 2016, I'm a little under the weather right now, but I really wanted to uh, introduce this year and be with you for this. You know, um, I was uh, sitting uh, with my prayer journal on New Year's Day, I was just writing down the things I was thankful for, and I just want you to know that you're at the top of the list. I, mean, I love being a part of this family, um, this church, and I love the way you respond. I love what you do. We, we finished last year with a flurry of kind of generosity and giving, and uh, I've been receiving these stories of you've been gifted, and uh, I just, I could share a bunch with you, but I just remember getting one from a a young woman who's a server at a restaurant, and she happens to be a member here. She just wrote me to tell me, you have no idea how much easier it makes, me, makes my ability to witness to my coworkers that they come with these cards and with just expressions of shock at the tips they got from people at Christ Community Chapel, and they've been gifted. So um, wonderful stuff. Thanks for being who you are, for responding the way you do. All right, um, January is the, is the month that we uh, give the theme for the year. Every year we have a theme here at Christ Community Chapel. We have a, a purpose of why we exist. We exist to help people come to know Jesus so you can grow in your relationship with him and then serve him daily. That's our purpose year in and year out. But every uh, year we have a different theme to help us focus on one of those areas, uh, either to serve Jesus more or to know him better. Uh, last year was the why not me theme, and it was a serving theme. What, why not God use me right here, right now to do something for you and with you? This year is going to be a growing theme, and we're going to call it simply know the story. Know the story. And it's pretty simple. What we want is for in 2016, every single person that goes to Christ Community Chapel, whatever campus you go to, that you will know the Bible better by the end of 2016 than you do right now. You're going to know the Bible better no matter how long you have been familiar with the Bible, no matter how much you've read, because it's not just reading the Bible. I want us to know the flow and the themes of the Bible, because the Bible is a, a tough book. Uh, it's usually over a, a thousand pages long. It's divided into 66 smaller books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New. And we usually break it up into sections. And then we take a section and we use it kind of as a, a lesson for life. But the Bible is written as, a, as kind of a, a history of the universe, a brief history of time. It's a, the epic story of the creation of the world and how the world was wrecked through sin and how God sends a Savior into the world named Jesus to save us from our sin and from evil and from death. And then ultimately, there's a restoration of all things and a new heaven and a new earth. It's the story of all stories. It's, the, it's kind of the, the template for every story you have ever really loved your entire life. Every fairy tale, every great movie, every great book starts out with this, this theme of what, of what has been given, and then there's this crisis of it seems like it's gone forever, and then there's an introduction of a hero who at great sacrifice then restores all things, and there's happily ever after. And the reason that is the template for every great story is because it's written into the very fabric of our universe. So this year is going to be the year that we really get to know the story, and I'll tell you how we're going to do it. These first uh, six weeks... Uh, we're going to take, we're going to do kind of a 30,000 foot flyover of the entire story and hit the six major themes. Uh, this week, weekend, we're going to hit creation. Next weekend, the fall, how the world was wrecked through sin. The third week is going to be Israel, and that'll take up most of the Old Testament is Israel. The fourth week will be Jesus. The fifth week will be the church. And the sixth week will be the restoration, a new heaven and a new earth. New earth. Then we will start in the Old Testament by going through the characters, the people of the Old Testament, because God uses people, and sometimes it's easier to get the whole gist of the story going through people. And so we'll start with Abraham, and we'll go through Joseph, and then Moses, and then David, and then Daniel, and that'll take us through the Old Testament. 
And then we'll introduce Jesus and then the book of Acts and the, the birth of the church. And that thing will take us from January this week until the first week of December of uh, 2016. In March, we're going to have some experts come in to our church for a weekend, for a one-day seminar on a Saturday. And they're going to teach us kind of the, the whole Old Testament in a single day so that you, will, you can get to know uh, what every single book of the 39 books of the Old Testament is kind of about, and you'll remember it because they have a memory system to help you remember it. Uh, it'll be, we have uh, space for 400 adults and 250 children that we have kind of reserved. So when that comes up, uh, the, to know the Old Testament, reserve that Saturday and come and be a part if you've ever wanted to know. So if somebody says to you, what's Hosea about? You'll be able to say, oh, in a single sentence, this is what Hosea is about. And then in September, we're going to have pass one of these out to everybody. This is a New Testament, but it's written like a normal book without uh, kind of chapters and verses, and it's more in the chronological order of the way it was written. Uh, and what we're going to do is uh, pass one out to everybody, and in a the way it works is that we're going to have everybody read 11 pages a day, five days a week for eight weeks, and all of us will read the whole New Testament together in those eight weeks. Uh, every adult and every child. Uh, we'll have it on audio for children so that they can stay up to date, so that you can talk about it as a family, and all of us as a church will go through the whole New Testament. All right? It's going to be a cool, cool year. All right, so if you've ever wanted to know the Bible better, this is your year. 2016 here at Christ's Community Chapel. So welcome to 2016. Know the story. I'm pumped. All right? All right, let's get into uh, creation. Uh, this is the first big theme. One of the problems with a 30,000-foot flyover is there's so many things you miss. Uh, but uh, I'm just going to try to give you an idea uh, of creation. And let me uh, have you turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. I'm going to read the whole first chapter, Genesis 1. That's what it says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse, and it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit, in which there is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years and let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth to rule over the day and over the night to separate the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarm according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things. 
and beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food, and every beast of the earth, and every bird of the heavens, and everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life. I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. This is God's word. Wow. <clears throat> There's a ton there. And I could go a lot of different directions. I'm not going to go towards uh, kind of a, a defense of creation over evolution. I've done that in other places. And uh, I did it particularly in a series called Christianity Fact or Fiction. So if you're interested in that, you can look that up. But I just want to go over what the Bible says about creation. And since I can only do a few things, I want to pick out three major themes from creation that follow through the whole rest of the Bible from cover to cover. And the three themes are love, glory, and blessing. Love, glory, and blessing. We see them here in Genesis 1. They explode again in the person of Jesus Christ, and then they're seen again in the book of Revelation at the end of all history. All right? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the theme and why it's a theme, and then I'm going to kind of tell you why it's important and what it means to us, and then how it fits into the overall theme of the whole Bible, all right? Uh, first, in the beginning was love. Verses 1 through 3, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. We see something interesting right at the beginning, right as creation is taking place, and it has to do with God himself. It says that God was there, and then the Spirit of God was hovering over the surf surface of the deep, and then it says that God speaks creation with his word into being. God doesn't make light. God speaks light. In the, the Gospel of John, John begins his gospel... Uh, echoing Genesis 1. And this is what it says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. One of the things that we see right at the beginning of creation is the very nature of God. Because the nature of God, of the biblical God, is that of a trinity. That's what we call it. That's why God speaks of himself in the plural form. Let us make man in our own image. The nature of God in the Bible is completely different than, let's say, the nature of the God that Muslims worship named Allah. Allah is singular. He's not Trinitarian in nature. So that means that he is he is absolutely different in his essence than the God of the Bible. So never think, I mean, I know that there's a controversy going on. Is, is, this, is it the same God that, that Muslims worship and Christians worship? Absolutely not. And we see that right at the beginning. What, what it says, what Jesus says in, in John chapter 17 is that the Son glorifies the Father and the Father glorifies the Son and glorify means that, that is praise and it's worship and it's honor and it's love. And what we see in the Bible is this, this God before creation, existing from eternity past, in kind of this swirling relationship among himself where the Father loves the Son, who loves the Spirit, who loves the Father. 
And there's this kind of swirling vortex of love and joy. And out of that comes creation. Randy Alcorn, in his book, Happiness, says that uh, because of the nature of God himself, in this swirling love relationship within himself, because creation came out of that, what he says is the, the sound that echoed throughout space during creation was the sound of raucous laughter. Isn't that cool? That God would be laughing while he created. And Job chapter 38, when God is dressing down Job, he says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth and all the angels shouted for joy. And what, he's, what you picture is that the angels watching God create, kind of like uh, we watch a firework display where an, an explosion goes off and we just go, oh my gosh, look at that. Angels covering their mouths while God threw supernovas into the universe. Into, it creates matter and energy for the first time. And they high five each other and laugh at what is going on. Why is there such detail and beauty with creation? It's because the God of the universe who created it was love, he created it in love and joy. Now, what's that mean to us? Well, it means a couple of things. One, it means that creation for the Christian is a good thing. The physical world is good. It's a gift from God. Uh, the Greeks thought that the physical world was evil and the spiritual world was good. And they either taught one of two things. Either you don't worry about how you respond to the physical world because it's only your spirit that matters, or you try to distance yourself from the physical world so that you can be holy. Right? Buddhists believe that the physical world is an illusion and all your pain is due to your, your desire for things in the physical world. So you separate yourself from your desire. But Christians, we teach that creation is not God but it was given by God as a gift of love because God in his essence is love. And so we take creation as a different thing and that's why we can enjoy creation without worshiping creation. We don't shun it. We receive it as a gift. The other thing that it means is if God is Trinity and he is in relationship and he creates out of that relationship and he creates us as image bearers, that means that you can expect to long for relationship and to long for love from your first breath till your last breath. And that's indeed what we find. In the beginning was love. The second theme is in the beginning was glory. Uh, when you look at creation, creation can tell us something about the creator the way art can tell us something about the artist. In fact, the psalmist in Psalm 19, he says this, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. The psalmist says creation itself tells us, shouts at us something about the creator. But there's only one, cre one creation out of all, the, all of his creation that he says, if you want to know what I'm like, if you want to know the closest semblance to who I am, look at this one thing. It's not what I would have chosen, by the way. I would have chosen something like, I would have said uh, as God, if you want to know what I'm like, look at an eagle in all of its beauty and all of its gracefulness and all of its fierceness. Look at the eagle. I'd say, look at a supernova, look at a volcano, look at some, you know what he says? Uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. In the image of God, he created us. You. You and I stamped with the image of God. God says, you want to know what I'm like? Look at a human being. Look at a human being. They reflect who I am as creator. What's that mean for us? Well, it means a few things. One of it, it's called the Imago Dei in Latin, which is the image of God. It is the, the basis, the foundation for all human rights, by the way. The idea that we are made in the image of God is what gives us dignity and value. It's the basis for all civil rights. One of the things that frustrates me with atheists is that they're so inconsistent. Because you'll have atheists talk about atrocities or talk about human rights or talk about civil rights, but they say there is no God. And when I say they're inconsistent, I just uh, was reading a book called uh, um, Fool Talk, Fool's Talk by Oz Guinness. 
And he says the same thing. Because if there is no God and we are all products of evolution, then there is only one law, and that's survival of the fittest. That's the only law. There is no other morality. There is no right or wrong. There are no atrocities. An anteater comes upon a mound of 20,000 ants. He doesn't call it genocide. He calls it a feast, right? (laughs) It's survival of the fittest. But we know inside of us, even atheists look at ISIS and say, what is going on? That's an atrocity. It's awful. You know why? Because we're, we are stamped with the very image of God, and that gives you value. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what your intellectual capacity, because you are in the image of God and stamped with his image, you have value and dignity above all other creation. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. will celebrate his birthday later on this month. It's what he said in a sermon. He says, you see, the founding fathers were really influenced by the Bible. The whole concept of Imago Dei, the image of God, is the idea that all men have something within them that God injected, an ability to have fellowship with God. And this gives him a uniqueness, a worth, and dignity. And we must never forget this as a nation. There are no gradations in the image of God. Every man from a treble white to a base black is significant on God's keyboard precisely because every man is made in the image of God. Yeah, that's one thing it means. But the other thing it means is that you are an image. That means you are a reflector. You are like a mirror that reflects the image of God. There is no light in you. Glory means uh, significance. It means weight. What it means to be an image, to be a reflector, to be a, a mirror, is that there is no significance that you can give yourself. You receive the significance from outside of yourself. You only receive and reflect glory. You don't produce glory. But the fact that you're made in the image of God means that if you are facing God and reflecting him, you can actually reflect some of his character on the relationships there and the world around you. You can reflect, as, a, as an image bearer, you can reflect the goodness, kindness, compassion, love, holiness of God. And when you do, if every human being did that, perfectly reflected the image of God on all around him, then the whole world would flourish. Things flourish when you reflect the image of God but you have to be facing him, right? As people turn away, as you turn away from the glory of God, then you will lose that and you will begin to reflect less and less of God's character on the people that you're around. I get calls from from marriages that are disintegrating. And a lot of times it'll be a man that'll say, you know what, Um, yeah, my my wife's done and and she doesn't want to be married anymore and I know I haven't been the man that God wants me to be. You You know what he's saying? He's saying, I know I haven't faced God. And so I haven't reflected on my wife the love and compassion and kindness and care that I should have as an image bearer because that's what God made me to do. Instead, I've turned away and my wife has shriveled up and now she's saying she doesn't want to be married and now I need help, right? That's what he's saying. Now, this is what happens. Because you are not um, a reflector, you can't create your own significance, your own glory, What happens is, uh, you you ever talk to somebody who says, I don't care what other people think? I don't care. (laughs) That's a lie. We all have to care because you can't can't build yourself up. You can't go, you know what, I don't care what anybody thinks. I go to a valley once a week and I shout and I hear my echo come back to me. And I stand in the valley and I shout out, you're a good guy, you're a good guy, you're a good guy. I love you, I love you, I love you. You're a winner, you're a winner, you're a winner. You know, you can't, you, you can do that for a week right? And it wouldn't, ha- it wouldn't have near the impact as if you were sitting at a coffee shop and had a complete stranger come over to you and said, hey, listen, I just want you to know, you're the best looking person here. There could only be one other person in, the star- in, that, in that coffee shop. You'd still be going, I feel good, right? <laughs> because you're not, you don't create it within you. You have to be given it. It has to come from the outside. You were made as an image bearer. You're made to bear the very image of God. So you were made, you and I were made to look in the face of God and to receive the glory of God that fired the sun. That's what you were created for. But we have turned away, we'll cover this next week, we have turned away from that glory and instead what we do is we settle for 
like a, like a little candle like this, and we try to get as close as possible to give us significance. This could be our job. It could be how well you do a sport, like Kobe Bryant. I mentioned him a couple weeks ago. It could be your spouse. It could be your children. And you're saying, this is what will give me significance if I'm a good parent, if I'm a good spouse. You ever hear a man say to, the, to a woman, you're my everything. You mean everything to me. Sounds so romantic. You know what he's saying? You, you better never flicker. You better never, never, ever move away from me. You know why? Because if you do, I'll die. Nobody can take that kind of pressure. You weren't built for it. You, the human soul was not built to be warmed by anything but the glory of God. And we settle for so much less. And then when it goes out, when you lose your job, when you lose your kids, when you lose your spouse, then you die. You're made to bear the image of the invisible God to reflect his glory because you were made for that. In the beginning was glory. Final thing was in the beginning was blessing. In the beginning was blessing. And this Help me understand something about myself. Maybe it'll help you understand something about yourself. One of the things that's great, <clears throat> and that you can see, when I, that's why I read the whole chapter, is that over and over again, almost after every day, God says the same thing, the same refrain. He says, and God looked at all that he had done, and it was good. And God looked at what he had created, and it was good. And finally, in verse 31, it says, and God looked at all he had done, and behold, it was very good. God is saying that not because he's surprised that he made some pretty cool stuff. I mean, he's not going, oh my gosh, I didn't know it was going to be that good. He's, he's giving a benediction. He's giving it its blessing. He's saying, this is good. You are good. And that's what clicked with me. Because every single human being goes through life longing for someone to say, you're good. I'm pleased with you. And most of the time, we think that we need to hear it from our parents, and you do. I mean, if you've never heard your dad or your mom look at you and say, I want you to know, I am proud of you. I love you. I am pleased with you. Then you have this longing, this thirst. But even those of us who had great parents who told us that over and over and over again still have a longing. You know why? Because we long for the, the benediction, the blessing of God himself to say to us, you're good. I'm pleased with you. So in Genesis 1, this epic story begins with God. And in the beginning was love. And in the beginning was glory. And in the beginning was blessing. Right? And then we see it as a theme go throughout the whole Bible. We lose it in Genesis 2. Right? We lose all three. We lose glory, we lose blessing, we lose love, the love of God. And then Jesus shows up. Right? Let's, let's talk about love first. Right? So, so we, we, it starts with love. We're created out of this, from this, this vortex of love that God pours out of himself, and that's how creation begins. When Jesus shows up, Genesis, or, uh, John chapter 3, verse 16, says, For God so loved the cosmos, that's the word in the Greek. God so loved the world that he gives his only begotten son. Love re-enters the world. God's love shines again in the person of Jesus. In the book of Revelation, all of history ends at a wedding where we celebrate the love of Jesus for us, the church. Right? Then glory starts with glory. We were made to reflect the image of God. Then we lost that. Genesis 2, we'll talk about that next week. Jesus shows up and he tells people, when you have seen me, you've seen the Father. I am the exact reflection of God the Father. Paul the Apostle in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 says this, For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, that's the creation, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. In the book of Revelation, it says in Revelation chapter 21, verse 23, and the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the lamp. And then finally, blessing. You know, God 
gives his blessing in Genesis 1, we lose the blessing in Genesis 2. When Jesus shows up, he comes out of the water of baptism, God thunders from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That's the benediction of God. Someday, because of what Jesus has done on the cross, you will enter into heaven, and he will say to you, you will get the benediction finally. God will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Now, this is what's interesting to me, is that the entire theme of the Bible is tied into these three things. We lose the love, the glory, and the blessing in Genesis 2. Jesus comes with all three, love, glory, blessing, gives them all up on the cross, all of them, so that we could be recovered and then recover the love, the glory, and the blessing of God. Know the story. It's a great story. From beginning to end, this story of God sending Jesus to restore all things, including you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for uh, your word. Thanks for uh, this story, which is not just your story, it's our story, because you call us into this. Uh, Lord, thank you for uh, restoring uh, us through Jesus and that he had all of your love and all of your glory and all of your blessing and he gave it up for us so that we might be recovered, saved. I pray that we will all get that deep down inside of us this year, more than ever before. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.